Okay, it is seven o'clock. So it's about time to get started. My question is, I'm wondering if you guys can hear me. So Helena, can you type in the chat box and tell me if you can hear me? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, maybe it's just me and you tonight. Some of the people who are getting on here may come. I did hear from a few people that they can't get on this week and that's totally fine. We're gonna talk about our subject and we will put it on YouTube so they can watch it later. So that will be good. So I'm gonna just go ahead and get started. And as people come in, I will let them into the classroom and we'll just keep going. My son Ezekiel will not be on tonight because he is had the opportunity to get a, a wood chipper for free for like today. And so he's chipping a great big pile of stuff. So that's pretty awesome. So he's gonna get a bunch of wood chips done. So I think that is, that is perfect. So we're gonna see if we can try to move some things around on my screen here. And we'll see what's going on. Okay, so here we go. We are gonna start talking about uh, just some of the same things we've talked about. People tell me I sound like a broken record. That's because I say the same things over and over. And I'm gonna keep saying the same things over and over until more and more people are doing this because this is a new type of gardening. It's a new type of farming because we're doing things so differently. We're not tilling. We are incorporating microbes into the soil. We are making compost for the purpose of growing microbes instead of making compost for plant nutrients. So we're gonna focus on just a few of these things here. And I wanted to spend a few minutes on this slide tonight on how to create a functioning soil in the vegetable garden. So hopefully you can see this slide. Can you guys type in here real quick and tell me if you can see this slide that says how to create a functioning soil in the vegetable garden. I'm trusting that you can see that. So thank you very much. Helena for saying yes. So here we go. The way we create a functioning soil is to not till. Uh, and then we have to feed microbes and then we have to introduce microbes. Why not till? Because tilling kills the microbes. It does not kill all the microbes. Tilling actually stimulates the bacteria. And so you have more bacteria with tilling. And when you get more bacteria, it creates more nitrate. And when you have high levels of nitrate in the soil, that stimulates weed seeds to germinate. So when we till the garden to control weeds, it makes more weeds grow. And if you think about this in nature, when you walk out into like a forest, you don't see all of those early succession weeds like lamb quarters, amaranth, um, quack grass, morning glory. We very seldom see those in soils that have been um, holding lots of microbes for a long time. It has a lot of fungal content in the soil. So when we stop tilling, a couple of things happen. Number one, it's cheaper and it's much less labor to grow food without tilling. We don't need to have the tillage equipment. We don't need the fuel that it um, takes. What we need with the garden is to simply grow the, um, we just need to grow the microbes. So how do we get those microbes in the soil in the first place? That is the question. How do we get the microbes in the first place? And that is the role of compost. So when I give speeches and teach classes about compost, people automatically think that making compost is all about having plant nutrients. And compost certainly does have plant nutrients in it, but that is not the number one purpose of compost. The number one purpose of compost is to grow the proper microbes. So let's just do a quick review 
right here on my hands. I'm going to do a quick review. We want to have, we should have you guys that have taken my classes say these, but I'm just going to do it. <laughs> so we want to have bacteria, fungus, protozoa, beneficial nematodes, microarthropods, incotreids, earthworms, and other things. Okay. So that's what we want in the, in, in a compost. That is the purpose of compost. Now, compost can be a good fertilizer. And when I say fertilizer, I mean a plant food, but that is not the number one reason to make compost. So uh, compost is uh, pretty important. So number two, um, planting new crops a few weeks before the last crops get harvested. Why would we do that? One of the main reasons is because these microbes that we're talking about, they have two food sources that we know of. Number one is the detritosphere. So the detritosphere is the dead organic matter that is on the ground. So if you have an animal uh, it, on the ground, on the land, like a cow, when they poop on the ground, that's part of the detritosphere. Also, it's the dead plants that die in the winter and the snow pushes it down onto the ground. When that begins to decompose, that is the detritosphere. And uh, so that's one reason we want that. But what does that have to do with planting new crops a few weeks before the other ones come out? Because sometimes the crops that are coming out, we could even leave those crops there. Um, last year, I had a whole bunch of green beans and I planted daikon radishes where the green beans were. And when I got finished harvesting the green beans, I just left the plants there and the daikon radishes grew, grew there with them. And it was fine. And the uh, green bean plants just decomposed in place. And so that is something you can do. Um, but the other thing is there's, and let's remember the second food source for the microbes, and that is the living root in the soil. So the living root in the soil, it will collect sunlight, carbon dioxide, it photosynthesizes, and it takes carbon from the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide into the leaf. It creates sugar through the process of photosynthesis. The sugars go down the stem into the roots, and then the plant puts those sugars into the soil. And when you put those uh, plants into the soil, what happens is the microbes eat those sugars. And so that's the second source of food for the microbes. So let's do a quick review. The two sources of food for microbes is the dead organic rotting plant material and the exudates that come out of the roots in um, different forms of sugars. And so some of those sugars are simple sugars, some are more complex uh, carbohydrates, but it's all sugar pretty much, uh, at least mostly sugar, okay? So that's why we plant new crops a few weeks before the last crop gets harvested because, and this is ideal, you can't always do this. You gotta remember that context matters. So if you go back and you know think about the soil health principles, context is one of those principles. So we need to remember that because maybe you have a system where you're gonna dig up your ground with a, like a potato harvester to harvest your potato crop. Well, it's gonna destroy your other crop if you already have planted it, like two weeks before you dig your potatoes. So if it's a potato field, a big one, and you're using, in, using machinery to harvest, obviously this doesn't work. But in a small home garden, this works very well. And you can plant seeds, or you could put in transplants a few weeks before your last crop or the crop that is there now gets harvested. And you would do that to keep that root in the soil to keep feeding the microbes. You don't want to take that microbe food away or else the colonies of microbes you have in the soil decrease too much and your soil stops functioning as well as it could. Let's move on to number three. 
um, earthworms in your soil create um, what we call the fifth sphere in the soil. If you remember back to our class on the five spheres in the soil, the last one was the drillosphere. Think of a drill. A drill makes holes in things. Earthworms drill holes in the, the ground. So we call that the drillosphere. So all through the soil, we have earthworms. And if you go out there and you measure 12 inches by 12 inches and you dig it up 12 inches deep. And so if you were going to be like do a scientific study, you would measure that out and try to get it as accurate as possible. And you would take that one cubic foot of soil out of the ground and you would take it all apart on like a piece of plywood or something. And you would count every single earthworm in there. And if you have about um, 20 earthworms in each cubic foot, you generally will have a pretty good functioning soil. And so that's kind of the key to the uh, to you know to know if you have a functioning soil, you're going to have about 20 earthworms. Now let's say that your soil um, does not have 20 earthworms. Does that mean your soil is not functioning? Not necessarily. See, there are a handful of ways that will tell you if the soil is functioning because you could have a soil that's growing beautiful plants and not have 20 earthworms. You could have much more than 20 earthworms and your soil is still um, doing a pretty good job. But if your soil is struggling, then this is something you need to strive for is to try to get about 20 earthworms in there to increase that drillosphere. So what does the drillosphere actually do? And why are we adding earthworms? The drillosphere are these great big giant channels. The, no, they're, it seems small to us because it's just the size of an earthworm, but to the microbes in the soil, which, and the, remember the microbes are the thing that makes the soil function. So the microbes in the soil, they see these great big, <laughs> excuse me, they see these great big earthworm holes and those are really huge. Those are big to a microbe. And so when the, it rains, the water comes down and it will go through the detritosphere that's on the surface of the soil. And it goes down through all of that detritus and then it'll hit those earthworm holes and then it will soak way down in. And as it does that, it will take microbes that are living in the detritus fair and it will put them deep into the soil, which is a good thing because you need those microbes to, to move around. And so uh, the earthworms are very, very important. So if we're trying to create a functioning soil, add earthworms, it will help. If you already have 20 earthworms per cubic foot, you probably don't need to add them. You probably need to add something else if your soil is not quite functioning. So number four, we want to test the soil for soil microbes, not for plant nutrients. Now, let me explain what this means. Uh, traditional tests for soil, they test for plant nutrients. And they will tell you how much nitrogen, how much molybdenum, how much calcium and phosphorus and all of these elements that is in the soil. Um, some soil tests will tell you how much carbon there is. Some soil tests will tell you a carbon to nitrogen ratio. Some soil tests will give you a fungal to bacterial ratio. And, you know, and there's other things. They're gonna tell you things like um, the cation exchange. There's different things soil tests will tell you. And depending on the test, and the lab doing the test, it could tell you like a lot of variables of some of the things I've talked about, okay? And then a lot of times the people uh, doing the test will, they'll get excited and they will say, okay, we're gonna give you a recommendation of what kind of fertilizer to put onto the, uh, the soil that we have just tested. So that's a pretty that's a pretty common thing to do, okay. Um, so, what else about soil tests? So the reason I'm saying to test for soil microbes and not for plant nutrients 
is because if all you're testing for is plant nutrients, you're going to have a problem uh, simply because you are now dependent on somebody to supply the missing nutrient for you. And we don't want to be dependent on someone to give you that, um, that nutrient, especially right now. Let's say you're a farmer with a thousand acres. You can't afford uh, fertilizer this year. You know, I mean, you probably haven't been able to afford it for a decade, but this year it's a lot higher priced. Uh, so there are other ways to get the soil to function so that you don't need those nutrients. Now, you can't do it overnight. You can't do it in a growing season. It's going to take um, two to five years to get to this point, but we better get started because uh, there are food shortages. And I don't care about whether, you know, these, you know, a lot of people are arguing and saying, well, that's man-made. Well, it's this and it's that. It doesn't matter. The fact is there's not as much food and what food there is, is um, rising in price every day. So uh, it's important to figure out how to grow the food without being dependent on fertilizers. And so there, that's why in number four here, it says to test for soil microbes, because here's what the microbes do. What you have is a predator prey relationship. So I'm gonna hold up my hand right here. If you're looking at my picture. So the first group are the bacterias. Now bacteria, they are mineralizers. So they will eat the exudates from plant roots and they will eat the dead organic matter that's decaying. That's what they consume. And then they will do something else. They will mineralize. And let's just say they melt down sand, silt, and clay. And once they melt it down, it goes into a form that plants can take it up as a plant nutrient. Because the plant can't uh, mineralize those nutrients. But the uh, the bacteria has the enzymes to melt those rocks and then those particles are able to be absorbed by plants. So that in essence becomes plant fertilizer. So the second group is fungus. Fungus eats root exudates and it eats the detritus fare, which is the dead organic matter. So it sounded like bacteria, right? That's right. They both eat the same food sources and they both mineralize. So the fungus will mineralize also. The fascinating thing about fungus is the fungus is really big. Now, the strand of fungus called the hyphae is microscopic. Um, think of a fishing twine, but it's only one part of a fishing twine. If you could take a fishing twine and break that length, so we're not cutting it into lengths, but you break that piece that's long, Let's say it's made out of 10,000 fibers. Well, if you have one fiber, then that's the width of, a, of a, a fungal hyphae, but it can be very long. It can be hundreds, thousands of feet long. And so it can go out into, like it can go under the highway, over into a forest, and it can mineralize minerals that are hundreds, maybe like hundreds of feet, hundreds of yards, maybe even miles away. And it can transport through those microscopic hyphae nutrients that a plant needs that's hundreds of feet away. But if we're tilling the soil, we break those hyphae connections and then the fungus can't get those nutrients to the plants. So I say not to till. It's not the tilling is wicked or wrong. There's nothing wicked or wrong about it. We simply break the hyphae and then the fun, it's the uh, hyphae, the fungal hyphae is not functioning for us. Okay, so the and and then and then let's go to the third group. So we covered bacteria and fungus. They do the same thing for the plant, and they eat the same thing. And then we have the protozoa group. What do protozoa eat? Protozoa eat the bacteria. And because there gets to be too many bacteria. And if all you have is bacteria, then all you have is nitrate. And so you need to have um, the protozoa to eat all of the 
a bacteria and then the protozoa um when they die or when they poop the, it is ammonium which is another form of nitrate but it doesn't create the the weeds to sprout and so that's what we want we don't want those weeds sprouting so we need the protozoa and then there's the beneficial nematodes what do they eat well they eat all the groups there are different groups of nematodes the bad nematodes are the ones that most people hear about and they and so if you say the word nematode some people pronounce that nematode same thing just different pronouncing pronunciations like tomato or tomato same thing different parts of the world say it different so the nematodes there are the root feeding nematodes and yes they're bad because they can kill our good plants but they only grow in a low oxygen condition and so if our soils are functioning they'll be high oxygen and we won't even have to worry about those guys but the good groups of nematodes we have nematodes that eat each other and then we have nematodes that eat protozoa we have ones that eat bacteria and we have ones that eat fungus and when they die and when they poop, they create more ammonium. And so that's a good thing because ammonium is needed for our garden plants and it will stop the, the growth of the uh, weeds that are sprouting. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and then there's the fifth microscopic group, which includes all different kinds of creepy crawlies. And those are the microarthropods. Now these guys are pretty cool. And what do they eat? Well, they eat a whole bunch of these different things too. Most of them are eating the fungal group, but there's a lot of them that are eating lots of stuff. And so a lot of them have like big jaws and, and, and like feet, feet that do things. And they rip and they shred a lot of the organic matter while they're getting in there, sucking the juices from the, um, from the fungal hyphae. Okay, so that's what they're doing. So on number four here, when we're testing for the soil microbes, we want to know if that predator-prey relationship is intact. And if it's not intact, we need to introduce the group that's missing. So if most soils have bacteria, okay? And if they don't have bacteria, it's usually been contaminated with some kind of a toxin that has killed everything. But almost all soils that have moisture in them have bacteria. And a lot of soils have so much bacteria that about the only thing you can grow are weeds. So if you've ever heard anybody say, all I can grow are weeds because we try and nothing else grows. Well, then I, you know, I can say with 99% accuracy when I put it under my microscope, it's going to show bacteria, none of the other forms of life. Um, but so when we test our soils, if we start getting away from the old fashioned tests that the universities do and that most soil labs do nowadays, now there are some new tests out there that are pretty good that are testing for soil microbes, but they are, um, we, you know, but most tests and most agriculture are focusing on the plant nutrients and they're not focusing on the microbes that create the nutrients. All right, let me grab a drink of water. Okay, so let's move on to number five. Don't pile up your manure, you want to compost it. I put this in here because I know a lot of people who have a cow or they have some sheep or they have a bigger farm and it's a common thing for people to pile up their manure. And when they do that, they think it's a compost pile, but it's not. Composting is a specific thing you do with your organic matter to grow the microbes, all right? And if you do pile up your manure, it's gonna go anaerobic if you leave it in the pile. And again, anaerobic means low oxygen. So it's gonna go anaerobic and it will be start to grow bad guys. It will start to grow pathogens and it can grow disease causers. So we need to keep oxygenated. If you, uh, if you have fresh manure coming out of the back end of your milk cow, it's better to take that um, fresh manure and just put it out on your grass, um, you know, like the pasture where the cow is. If you're not gonna compost it, just get it out there on the land so that nature can do its thing. 
and that's totally fine and good. But once you start piling it up, you start asking for problems, okay? So number six, this one says rotate roots, not crops. So crop uh, rotation, we used to believe, and it's still true, but we used to believe that crop rotation was important to control pests and disease and to help with nutrient cycling in the, because different plants absorb different nutrients from the soil. But what we are learning in recent years, especially in the last decade or so, there's been a lot of people who have um, figured out that, uh, you know, the, these ideas are not, they're not really solid because they're not holding up. There's a lot of people who have been growing green beans in the same soil year after year after year. And they're not getting the diseases because they have a really good functioning soil. And, and that's what we're finding with almost all crops. If our soils are functioning and the, the ecological processes are working, we, you know, rotation of crops is becoming a thing of the past. So what I like to do is rotate roots because that helps to increase the functioning of the soil. So what does it mean to rotate a root? Well, you have different groups of roots and I'm just gonna, I'm just going to divide this into two groups to be really simple. There's the fibrous roots and then there's the tap roots. A tap root is something like a carrot or a parsnip or a daikon radish or a mustard. Those are tap roots. Uh, and then, so what is a fibrous root? Things in the grass family, um, uh, like tomato plants would be a fibrous root. Um, lettuce would be fibrous. And so when I say the grass, what's an edible that's a grass? Well, wheat, oats, barley, triticale, um, rye, those would, be, those would be really good fibrous roots. So in your rotations, just think, well, I grew a bunch of carrots in this row last year. Maybe I will put my tomatoes there this year. But you're not doing it for the purpose of trying to figure out how to keep diseases from coming into your plants or pests in your garden, you're doing it for the purpose of soil health. All right. So, so that's kind of, that's a fun thing. And it's kind of a new idea in the, in the agricultural world. Um, number seven, plant with a pointed stick, a paper plot transplanter or any no-till method. Okay. So what does that even mean? Well, people are saying, well, if we don't till the soil, how in the world am I going to plant my plants? Because we're used to nice, soft soil where we can, you know, make furrows or dig holes to put transplants in or to run our cedar through so that the, the seeds go in just right. And so those are the things that we're used to. So the number seven here, this is how you do it without no-till because you're going to have your just beds of permanent compost, uh, that permanent detritus sphere is up on top and hopefully it's three or four inches thick. And so just make uh, holes with a um, pointed stick or the drill logger. If you're following me on Patreon, you've seen videos of how to do that. And so when you drill those holes, you're just putting those pots right down in the ground. Um, or, and so that's how you do it. This is the method um of doing that now a paper pot transplanter that is different than when you've seen my videos of making a paper pot by hand um, this is something that you would this is stuff you purchase so you would have to have a good relationship with the company who are manufacturing these things because it's something you would have to purchase you can't make this uh, the paper pots the way they work um, so hopefully there's people in our communities who can make these things. I don't even know who does it. I don't even have a paper pot transplanter, but it would certainly work in a no-till system if you had a nice, um, beautiful four to six inch compost on top. Now, if you're gardening with more of the back to Eden method where you have lots of coarse wood chips on top, the paper pot transplanter may not work. I think you would struggle with it. So you would have to dial in exactly how you're doing it. But you don't even want a paper pot transplanting system unless you're growing food for other people. Uh, I mean, just to start with the equipment, it's over $3,000 just to get started. 
but compared to a tractor, um, it's a good way to go. So let's say that you were going to invest in that. I think it's a great investment if you're feeding, if you have a garden that's maybe an acre or up to five acres. I think even up to 10 acres, a paper pot transplanter would work. And then you could avoid the cost of the tractor. Okay. And if you want to know more about that, we can talk about that. So number eight, minimize monocrops and maximize diversity of plants and microbes. So that's one of the main things to create a functioning soil. We're minimizing monocrops. Sometimes when we're in a garden, we need it to be efficient. So if we're gonna plant our carrots, we don't just wanna put a carrot seed here and then put a carrot seed 10 feet away because when you go in to harvest your carrots, you want them right there so you can harvest them all at once. So a good rule is that you monocrop your rows and make your rows a little bit further apart. So if you want your row, if you normally have your rows two feet apart, go ahead and make your rows three feet apart. And then between the two rows that are the same crop, like let's say you have four rows that are all carrots, just make them a little bit wider. And then between each of those rows, put a mix of seven or eight different species growing in that mix to increase the diversity of the species growing there. And you will find that you will be decreasing insect problems, disease problems, because you have so many wonderful plants that are growing there. Okay. So you're maximizing the diversity. And when you maximize diversity of plants, um, uh, a whole new set of microbes come in. So you may be growing five groups of plants in your garden, and maybe you have 150,000 species of microbes in the soil, if we did a, a DNA test on the soil to find those microbes. But if you increase that to 20 different kinds of plants growing in the garden, that would bump you up to maybe 250, maybe over 300,000 species of uh, microbes in the soil. And the more species you have, the healthier your food becomes, the healthier everything is in that entire system, okay? All right, so number nine, save and breed your own seeds. This is much simpler than it seems. You don't need to be um, worrying too much um, about, you know, like charts and complicating the seed breeding. Seed breeding can be very, very easy. You just select the fruits that tasted the very best, save the seeds from those ones. And over time, like over the years, then those seeds that you're saving, they will adapt to your own climate and, and everything about your farm, they will start adapting to that and you will be growing more resilient plants. So it becomes very good um, to save your own seeds. And the last one on our list tonight, number 10, if you have big fields, so if we are going from uh, like home gardening to growing food for other people, you're probably gonna wanna be growing cover crops instead of adding compost to the top of that soil. Just because if you have a hundred acres, you can't make enough compost with a pitchfork and a, just a couple of compost piles. You simply can't produce enough compost um, on a gardening scale to fit the needs of a farming scale. So when you go from small garden plots you have to get that detritus sphere on the soil in a different way. And so the way that you do that is when you harvest your crop, uh, what you're gonna do is you plant the cover crop. So let's say you're growing corn. Well, when your corn gets harvested, this growing season's over, fall is here. Well, that's right when you plant your cover crop, your cover crop will grow into the late fall throughout the winter. And the next year when you plant again, then what you're gonna wanna do is you would roll down that, um, that tall cover crop, and then you plant your new crop for summertime in it. So you're always keeping that living root in the soil. 
and what you're rolling down becomes the new detritosphere for your uh, for your your microbes to eat. So there we go. So that was our little discussion on how to create a functioning soil in a vegetable garden. And the very same things are applicable for a vegetable garden or for a five acre farm or a 15 acre farm or a 15 million acre farm. If you do these things on this list right here, it doesn't matter if it's five square feet or even a pot, you know, if you're growing in a container on your balcony or on your back porch. These principles are the very same. So let's say you had 20,000 acre farm. Are you going to be doing number three? Are you going to be adding earthworms? Absolutely. Get some earthworm inoculum out there. Um, you know, it might take you a few years, but get your worm farm going so that you can get those worms out there. Absolutely. I don't care how big your farm is. If you go anywhere on your acreage and you don't have 20 worms per cubic foot, you are not where you need to be, probably. So, you know, we could discuss this forever, but we're not going to. We're going to get into questions. Uh, my son Ezekiel is not on tonight, so I am going to uh, pull the chat up over here. and I'm going to do this. The reason that Ezekiel is not on is he is making a big pile of wood chips because tonight was the night he had to use a wood chipper so he didn't have to pay for it. So that's pretty awesome. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down here. And I'm going to start reading these. And I'm just going to read the ones that are in here so far. So Melanie Fisher says, where can we test for soil microbes? I'm a laboratory, so you can send a soil test to me. Um, get an apple corer out of your drawer in the kitchen and go out and move uh, your detritus sphere away. So move any dead organic matter that's on top of the soil and then put your apple core down in the ground about three inches and then put that in a Ziploc bag. So in your garden, you want to give me a representative sample. So I need three cores. So you're gonna plunge that in, in three different places in your garden. And then you're gonna put it in a Ziploc bag and then you're going to put your name on it and you're going to um, and write on it with a Sharpie. Don't put a paper inside because the moisture in the soil will ruin the paper and I won't even know what it says. And then you send it to me. So it needs your name. If you send more than two, then I, you need to label sample number one, sample number two, so that you know if your soils are different. For instance, if you send me a sample from an orchard and then a sample from a vegetable garden, I need to know. So I need the name of your name, I need the name of the sample, and I need the date you took it, and then you want to overnight it to me, and I charge $150 for a sample, and then I need payment, and then we will run that sample, and then we, I would send you back a result of what microbes are in the soil, and then uh, how to get the microbes in there that you don't have. And so that's how that works. So uh, where can we test for soil microbes? Um, in a new site on barren land, except for rocks and dirt, how can we best increase this as well as nutrients in the soil? If you don't do anything else, Melanie, get a detritus sphere on top of that soil, cover it with any organic matter and cover it enough that it works. You need a minimum of three to four inches of something that is going to decompose that's on top of that soil. Things like wood chips, leaves, um, old hay, animal manure, and don't till it in, just put it on top, just the way nature does. When you go out in nature, the leaves fall down in a forest and they stay on top and then the microbes are able to work with them. If you tell them in, the microbes don't know what to do with it. Um, if you're in a grassland, what happens? Herds of animals come along in a grassland and they will eat about one third of the grass and then they will tromp about one third of the grass in on the soil surface that kind of kills it. And then one third kind of survives and those become the solar panels to collect new photons 
and um, carbon dioxide from the air, and then the grass grows back. Okay, so we want to mimic nature. So the best thing you can do, Melanie, is cover that soil with any kind of organic matter you can get. Cover it up. Now, are you covering it with plastic tarp? You could, but that is not a detritus fear. It's not going to feed the microbes. So when I co say cover it with anything you can get, I mean cover it with detritus, which is any kind of organic matter that's going to rot on the ground. Okay, so on to the next question. Another comment here from Melanie. How do you fix anaerobic planting material so it becomes healthy? So with anaerobic planting material, um, so it's only anaerobic if it is smells bad, okay? Only if it smells bad. Now, in other webinars, I have said that if it's black, it could be anaerobic. If something is black in color, it is a sign that it has been anaerobic. But if it smells good right now, then it the anaerobes have died and it has become aerobic. So it's safe to use. So if you want to fix anaerobic planting material, spread it out less than one foot thick because then the oxygen will penetrate, a, you know, Oxygen penetrates 12 inches. So if it's eight inches, it will turn aerobic. So spread whatever you have out, less than one foot thick, and it will turn aerobic over time. Once it stops smelling bad, then it is safe to put where you want to grow food. All right, so that's how you do that. And then it'll become healthy. So here you continued, I pulled out all the wild ver um, various in my beds. I'm not sure what that means. Should I have kept the root in the ground? I always keep um, roots in the ground when I pull stuff out because it's more work to pull it out. It doesn't make sense to keep the roots in there. Um, if you have, um, I mean, it's fine to pull roots. I mean, that's the tradition. That's the Georgic tradition. We want to pull everything out. Um, if, it's a, if it's a vicious plant that's going to grow back way faster than your other crops that you want to have there, just put a sheet of cardboard on it so that it kills it out. And then on the cardboard, put six inches of a good finished compost is the best thing. And then plant in the compost the cardboard will decompose over time, but it won't decompose until the, your plants have already died underneath. So that's an easier way to do it. What about using a short head rake to level the soil you plan to plant in? It's fine to level your soil, but once you get it leveled, then you don't need to do it ever again. Um, so like leveling it out is not exactly tilling. Um, I pulled out all the wild carrots in my beds. Should I have kept the root in the ground? Uh, yeah, I think we already covered that. It's the same as what I already said. Can a cover crop help in a very small garden space? Absolutely, cover crops always help. But think about it, in a very small um, growing space, why would you grow a cover crop if you could grow an edible crop? See, the purpose for a cover crop is to only feed the microbes if you don't have a big commercial crop you're going to grow. So in farming, where we're talking about acres that are really big, you may only have a market for corn. If you have 10,000 acres and all you're growing is corn, well, you don't really have a crop you can grow because of maybe your climate or whatever. You don't have a crop to grow in the winter. But in a, in a small garden area, let's say you have your vegetable garden growing, through the growing season. So what is an edible that you could grow on half of that garden through the winter? You could grow oats and then you could harvest the oats in the summer and then you could plant your fall garden. So what do you do in the, the other half? Well, maybe you could um, grow, you know, What's another edible that would go through the garden uh, the winter? You could grow fava beans, and then you could be harvesting those early in the spring because they grow in most of North America throughout the winter. It would have that living root in the soil. So there's an option. 
Um, so you just have to think this through. So if you can grow an edible, always do that. Um, the only reason you would grow the cover crop would be because you have too much land to grow an edible. Does that make sense? If that didn't make sense, we can keep talking about it. Can a cover crop help in a very small garden space? That's the one I just read. Maybe it's not. What about trying to plant a cover crop in a rocky slope? Sure, yeah, cover crops would be great on a rocky slope. Um, it, it, I mean, what are you going to do with the rocky slope? You know, are you trying to grow food there? Why are you growing a, a cover crop? Because you're just trying to get the soil to function. But why do you want it to function? Maybe just start out by growing something there that is an edible that would, um, you know, grow on that place. Like, why not cover it with strawberries or raspberries or blackberries or apple trees? You know, if, it, if it's not a place where you're going to be maybe growing a, a delicate vegetable that needs a deeper soil, like a carrot or a parsnip or a potato, if it's more rocky and it's sloping, put some perennials there. That would be my, that'd be my idea. So what do you mean by rolling down a cover crop? So you smash it flat on the ground. So a roller crimper is an agricultural tool that is used to um, roll down the cover crop. But in a garden, you would go out there and you would step on it and you would smash it down. Uh, with, uh, like if you had a herd of cattle, you wouldn't roll down a cover crop. You could turn the herd of cattle into a field for one day and they would tromp it for you. They would eat a lot of it and they would smash it down and then you move them out and then you could plant a, another crop behind the cattle. That would be another way to do it. But a, a roller crimper is the, what a to, the tool is called. So rolling down the cover crop means that you take the cover crop that's standing up because it's going toward the sky. We push it flat down on the ground so that the microbes can begin to decompose it. Um, a lot of the grasses on the Great Plains are going extinct because the buffalo don't do what they did for thousands of years because the buffalo are no longer there. So what we're finding when we study that part of our ecology is that the plants will stay standing and if they're not rolled down by a person with a machine and they're not crushed by herds of buffalo or another kind of animal, and people don't use cattle to do the same thing, then they don't decompose in the same way. They will decompose, but instead of decomposing biologically, which it takes being smashed on the ground, another thing that'll smash it is snow. But if you don't get enough snow to smash it, then they decompose a different way, which is called a chemical decomposition. So when you walk outside and you're looking at grass that is dormant, if it gets, if it goes on the ground by wind, snow, animal, or man, then it will get moisture in it. And when it gets moisture in it from being on the surface of the ground, it decomposes um, biologically. And that's what we want. Because if it stays standing for two or three years and nothing smashes it, it's a chemical decomposition and it will be gray. It will look gray. So when you walk out in the land and you see gray dead grass standing, it's decomposing chemically. If it's yellow and it's standing, it was last year's growth and it needs to be smashed. But a two-year-old growth will be turning gray. And when they turn gray, the new plants on the soil surface, they don't grow back. And then the plant dies. It has to decompose. But the chemical decomposition of when it stays standing upward, it takes too long and then the plant dies. And that's what desertification is caused from. There is one more tool that nature uses and humans use to get rid of the grass and that is to burn it. But burning is frowned upon. I frown upon it. I don't like burning because it removes the detritus sphere and so your microbes are starving to death. They don't have that as a food source. And I don't like burning because it puts the carbon that needs to be in the soil, it puts it in the atmosphere. And we have way too much carbon in the atmosphere and not enough in the soil. 
So the plants are requiring fertilizers because we are starving our microbes that need it on the ground. Okay. So that's what we mean by rolling down a cover crop. Um, Charla says, what seven or eight species would you suggest putting between rows? Good question. I envision myself trampling it while I pull weeds. That's a good thing because you need that to try to spare down. But you're probably thinking it's a bad thing because you don't want to trample it. Um, while I pull weeds growing in my veggies, um, battling buttercup, thistle, stinging nettles, and blackberries. This is our first year in this home slash garden. Okay, let me think about that. Buttercups, thistles, stinging nettles. Okay, so um, there's three or four different species that people call buttercups. I wish I knew which, exactly which um, species you're talking about. But thistles are in early succession. Stinging nettles are early to mid succession. Um, blackberries are a, like a late succession. So that's pretty awesome. So that's good. Um, maybe you don't think that's good. To me, those are good. You have good problems. Your soil is further along in ecology, which means you have a better functioning soil than, than not. Okay. Um, so if you're battling those things, it, use cardboard. Put cardboard on there and then cover the cardboard with stuff. <laughs> like wood chips or old hay. You know, everybody, you know, I say old hay all the time and somebody's going to get angry because you're going to put old hay out there and a bazillion weeds are going to grow. So 100% of the time when I say old hay, I mean old hay where the weeds in it have already grown. So if you just break open a, a bale of hay and you put it out there, you're planting billions of weed seeds. So what you need to do, if you use a fresh bale of hay, you need to break it open, you need to spray it with water until all the little seeds start growing. And then you need to get a pitchfork and you need to turn it around and mess it up. And then you need to let it dry out for a week so that the weed seeds die. And then you need to spray it again so that the weed seeds sprout because they all didn't sprout. You need to do this five or six times. Does this sound like a lot of work? Can be a lot of work. That's why I say old hay, because in the world that I live in, old hay is something that has been discarded and all the weed seeds have already been, um, they've already been sprouted. Okay, but you could sprout um, weed, the, the seeds in the hay from, uh, from new hay or from um, like just, just hay. So when I say old hay, I have a different paradigm um, than some people may have. Anyway, hopefully that was helpful. So back to Charlotte's question, what seven or eight species would you suggest putting between rows? Uh, one thing that I really love putting between the rows in the gardens is uh, a honeybee flower mix or a butterfly flower mix, better yet, um, get a honeybee flower mix, like 10 seed packets of that, and then get 10 seed packets of a, of a butterfly. So you get the butterfly and the honeybee. That's what I'm saying. You mix both of those together and you scatter them all over your garden. I mean, you make a mess of it. So you got weeds coming up everywhere. And that would be a pretty good mix for your, for your gardens. Um, so if you want to control where they're coming up, plant them in rows between your rows of vegetables. Okay. But there's a, a species called Phacelia. It's a good one. Um, you know, there's a lot of them. I'm not going to name seven or eight species. I'm just going to leave it at that. Go research your, um, your butterfly and honeybee seed mixes, get some of those and plant them. Those will be good ones. Okay. You could do edibles too. If you didn't want to do that, let's just say all edibles. Let's say you do a row of carrots and then do a row of um, tomatoes, do a row of something else. Don't have all your carrots on one side and all your tomatoes over here. Don't mix your garden or don't separate your garden like that. 
mix everything up. Instead of having tomatoes in one row, put tomatoes sporadically around. Um, you know, that's a fun way to do a garden. And the more you mix up that diversity, the healthier your soil becomes. Um, I think I covered everything in this question. I'm gonna read through it again to make sure. What seven or eight species would you suggest putting in between rows? I envision myself trampling it while I pull weeds. That is a great thing to trample some plants out there in my veggies, battling buttercup thistles, stinging nettles. For some of those, especially the blackberries, cardboard is going to be your best friend. Cover the cardboard with six inches of something like wood chips. That'll help you. Okay, Helena, Helena says, would alfalfa be good for a cover crop or no? It depends what you mean by a cover crop. Usually when I say a cover crop, so like 99.999% of the time, when I say cover crop, I mean an annual plant. Uh, alfalfa is a perennial. Yes, grow the alfalfa. Alfalfa makes good honey for honeybees. Alfalfa has every vitamin known to man. You can cut the alfalfa and eat it. You can dry it and eat it and make tea out of it. I don't know any good recipes. If anybody knows, let me know. Um, you can feed it to livestock, obviously, because that's what people feed their livestock. But better yet, you can cut it and you can feed it to your microbes by making uh, um, compost out of it. You can use it as a mulch on top of your garden, underneath your plants. You can make uh, a tea out of it, put it in a blender, uh, and then run it through a strainer and use all that juice, mix it with some water, spray it on all your plants. Your gardens will thrive. No matter how you use alfalfa, your gardens will be better for using alfalfa. So yes, every garden in this country should have an abundance of alfalfa, but not as a cover crop. Uh, so grow your alfalfa where it can keep growing for a decade along a fence or in its own little patch because it will keep growing year after year. And you can get anywhere from three to seven cuttings from it, depending on where you are. It's worth a few square feet in any greenhouse to keep it growing throughout the year because it has so many benefits. I'll always have alfalfa, uh, but not really as a cover crop because you want to, the cover crop to terminate. If you're gonna go out there and step on your cover crop, and try to get it to die when you're walking on it, or to try to get it to terminate if you are using a uh, roller crimper, the perennials don't do that. It's just the annuals that do that. Um, things like oats, triticale, barley, rye. Um, what are some broad leaves? Like beans are, are good. So any of the bean families like um, soybeans or um, green beans, peas. So here's a fun cover crop. And this would be a, a food crop and a cover crop. Plant a whole field of bush beans that get like two feet tall. Go out there and pick all those. Some of them only get one foot tall. You go out and you pick 10 bushels of beans. And while the plants are still green, go out there, mow them down, roller crimp them down, whatever machine you have, and then plant the same day where those beans are, if you rough up the plants enough, so they will act as a detritus that you're putting on there to feed the plants. And it will, uh, has been a food crop. And that works good with peas and with beans, but you wouldn't want like peas or beans that are going up poles because when you go out to terminate it, you have all the poles to deal with. So just use the bush varieties, just let them sprawl on the ground. Go pick what you want and then um, terminate the rest, okay? So that's a good way to do it. Um, so as far as the alfalfa goes, I would not use alfalfas. I don't use clovers. I don't use the perennials as the, uh, yeah, if it's a perennial plant, in case you need definitions, a perennial plant is a plant that grows year after year after year. An annual plant is a plant that grows 
one year, it produces seed and it dies. So once this annual is producing seed, you terminate it either by roller crimping, crimping it or grazing it or jumping up and down on it or whatever. That terminates it because it was dying anyway. But you want to do it right before the seed is going to sprout and grow a new crop. So there's a timing issue when we terminate these, um, these cover crops that has to be done just right. So you have to be out there in your fields looking at them every day. Okay. So, so Helena, Helena, no on the alfalfa for a cover crop because it is, uh, because it's a perennial. Because if you go out there and roll a crimp, it's just going to grow back and you have an alfalfa field. So it's not going to work. Okay. So, so good questions tonight. Good questions. Thank you guys. This is good stuff. Um, Jocelyn, how soon after pulling a sample does it have to be tested? Okay, so um, you want to test that sample ASAP. If you're looking at it under your own microscope, look at it right now. If you're sending it to me, overnight it in the mail. Uh, because if it's in the mail for three or four days, half your mo microbes might be dead. And so the, the expensive test that you're getting done um, is not going to be accurate if I don't get the soil really quick. So let me finish your question to make sure that was even in context. How soon after pulling a sample does it have to be tested? If it's been sitting for a couple of weeks indoors with air circulation, am I still going to have an accurate representation when you look at it under a microscope? Probably not. You would have to keep several things accurate. You have to keep the same root exudates feeding the microbes in it. So as soon as you pull the test, the exudates stop because the plant is no longer photosynthesizing. It's no longer putting the exudates in the soil. That's why you have to look at it right now. Um, what else is different? The moisture levels are going to be different. So if it begins to dry out, then microbes are gonna to begin to die. So it's not gonna be the same. Um, what else would be different than when it's in the soil? Moisture, the exudates would be different. Um, those are the two big ones right off the top of my head. If it's in a Ziploc bag, which you should put it in a Ziploc bag when you send it to me, but if it's in that Ziploc bag long enough that the oxygen levels get used up, then the 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 aerobes in there using the the oxygen are going to begin to die or they will just go into a dormant stage so they will cystate or sporulate which is the dormant stages of the fungus and the the protozoa and the bacteria and all that stuff so that it's going to change it those are probably the three big ones the food source the oxygen source and the water source it's the same as any other animal you know so if if so let's say it this way i you know if if i'm if i sit for two weeks in an environment where i have no food no water and i i guess i have oxygen because you what did you say plenty of air circulation but no food and water for how long did you say a couple of weeks when a medical person examines me am i going to be the same as in a natural habitat where I've been getting a good night's sleep, plenty of good healthy food, lots of water. You see what I mean? The microbes are not that much different than us. So when you're looking under the microscope, you want it to be as soon as possible, as soon as you pull those tests. Okay, Melanie again. I pulled out all the wild weeds in my beds. Should I have kept the root in the ground? Absolutely. You always keep the root in the soil. Uh, because when you want to kill the plant, you want to keep as much of the detritus in there as possible. So we, when we say the detritosphere, we're usually talking about the dead plant material on top and the rhizosphere or the roots down in the ground. Well, if you're going to kill the plant, the root that you of the plant you killed, it becomes it trans it transfers from being a rhizosphere to part of the overall detritus sphere, meaning it's going to decompose and feed the, um, feed the microbes. So you always want to leave as much organic matter, whether it's a root or a stem or a leaf 
or a flower or a fruit, you always want to leave that stuff in the soil. Because if you remove it, you are removing the food source from the bacteria and the fungus. And you don't want to do that. Okay, you are really cutting out. Oh, that's bad. Sorry. Hopefully you guys can hear me again. What about a, because that was probably written 10 minutes ago. What about a clover crop? Um, can you trample it down? So we already covered that with Helena. I always say your name wrong. I apologize. With Helena's <laughs> um, question. So we already covered that. You don't want to use the uh, perennial plants because they're not going to die. In fact, tromping them will probably stimulate them to grow more. Would you tramp down a square foot type garden or do we want to keep those gardens loose? Well, that's interesting. See, when I say to trample it down, I am not talking about compacting or not compacting the soil at all. But I'm really sensing from what you're writing here that you're worried about soil compaction. Yeah, soil compaction is the number one problem in agriculture. If we solved all soil compaction, we probably wouldn't have food shortages right now because that's what the microbes do. Not only do they mineralize, but they make the soil fluffy and light. So I'm coming from a world view and an agricultural view that we have a functioning soil. So if you go out there and you're trampling down an already compacted soil, you're gonna make it much worse. So you don't really want to be jumping up and down on your gardens the way they are. Um, so be careful doing that because human foot traffic will absolutely cause compaction. So yeah, within a square foot garden, stay off of it. But guess what? I walk over my garden beds all the time because I don't care about soil compaction because I'm not compacting them because I'm not on there enough because I have really loose, wonderful, beautiful soil that is like spongy. When you walk across your garden, it should feel like walking barefoot on the most lush, plush, um, like, you know, those carpets in people's houses that are really expensive that have two or three pads underneath them. So when you walk on them, it's like you're walking on a waterbed. It, your, your gardens, your lawns, your pastures where your livestock are should feel that way. When you trip and fall flat on the ground, if it feels like you hit a, like a, what do they call those things where you do gymnastics and you fall on the, like wrestlers have those pads in the gym. That's how it should feel. When you fall on that, it doesn't hurt. You're just frustrated that you tripped. But when you hit and it feels like concrete, you have a problem and your soil is not functioning. Okay. So absolutely, you want to keep the gardens loose. So all of this talk that I've been talking for 20 minutes or even longer about trampling it down, we're just talking about we very gently want to take the standing plant material, put it on the ground. We don't want to crush your soil at all. Okay, so that's a good, I'm glad you asked that question. Thank you, because I needed to make that distinction. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on here. Okay, Becky says, I've heard that adding ash from my fireplace to my soil is a good thing. Is that true or false? So this is a tricky one. I would not add ash to soils. What ash is going to do is it's going to change the pH from like, so it's, it's going to change your pH. But in functioning soils and in soils we're trying to get to function, we don't want to change pH because it messes with stuff in the soil. So don't add ash from your fireplace to the soil. Do something else with your ash. It's better to make soap out of it or whatever. Make the lye water to make soap. There's other things you can do with ash. Don't add ash to garden soils. So I should just leave it at that and not complicate it. But what you want to do is add organic matter to soils, but not in the form of ash. Now, there is a thing called biochar, and that's different than wood ash. And so if somebody has a, some biochar and they give it to you, you could certainly add that. 
because the microbes live in it, but it acts different than wood ash. So my recommendation is don't use ashes from your wood stove. Melanie Fisher again, thistle makes a great fertilizer tea for plants. Thistle makes a great or fertilizer tea for plants. Um, is that a question or a comment? Charlotte to everyone, I need to walk in between my rows to pull out the buttercup that are choking out my seedlings and starts. Is there something I can walk on? And I need to walk in between my rows to pull out the junk. I don't know what, what you mean by, is there something I can walk on? I'm confused by what you're asking. If you would like to unmute right now and let's have this discussion, that would be wonderful. Maybe Charlotte doesn't have a microphone. It was on her phone. Sorry, <laughs> I'm here. Um, okay, what good. I meant, well, you were saying lay cardboard and I, that's what I'm working on right now earlier is laying the cardboard between my rows to help with the weeds. But you were saying to grow things between my rows to add that diversity so i'm thinking well i really need to walk between my rows <laughs> right now to get all the weeds out yeah okay yeah um oh let me think about this you're over complicating this okay you're thinking like right now today <laughs> i'm probably the one over complicating it let's be clear <laughs> okay so I'm thinking long term. I'm thinking over the span of the next five years of having this abundant, beautiful garden. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I have all these weeds. I got to get rid of them. What do I do? Yeah, just don't worry about it too much. Just plant your food that you want, deal with the weeds however you need to. When it gets to a place that you can manage it pretty good, then then this is where you can start. Let's say your weed problem is pretty much taken care of. That's when you start bringing in diversity. But you do want to remember something. Remember that weeds are diversity. Not all weeds are bad. Now, if you have a bazillion of them and they are crowding and shading your edibles, obviously that's bad. And so you need to go in there and get a bunch of that junk thinned out. Okay. But I mean, we're having, uh, like, I've got, like, I don't know, some of you may know Dr. Shannon Brooks from uh, Monticello College. He's here this week with his students, and we did a, a week-long boot camp with them to teach them everything I know, which I don't know if I did, but I surely tried. But we just finished up today, and it was super fun because it was interesting to watch the students interacting with some of my weeds in the greenhouse, because I have a lot of weeds out there. And I think some of them were surprised at how many weeds I allow to grow. Um, one student said, do you want me to pull these? Could I help you? And I said, no, 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 I like those. Those are good. And they were just like, they were looking at me with a blank stare because to, that, to them, that was a really bad thing. And to me, it's diversity because with a minimum of four plant families, I can have cool things start happening when the roots of four plant families are mingling underground because there are certain viruses and um and the quorum sensing of the bacterias will start turning on genes that plants won't express unless you have a lot of different plant families and it won't happen if you only have three plant families but sometimes it's hard to manage a food growing system where we have like, like, say I'm going to grow cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, um, kale, and I have a big patch of those. Well, they're all the same plant family. So that's one plant family. They're all in the brassica, brassica family. So it's nice to have a few weeds in there because if I let three different species of weeds grow, th they could easily belong to three different other families. So there's my fourth plant family. As long as I don't let that weed go to seed, I'm not perpetuating a big problem into the future. 
but the soil is functioning at a level where I want it. So don't, don't be afraid of weeds. Uh, weeds can be our allies as long as they're not stopping the growth of your edibles and as long as they're not perpetuating a huge problem in the future by making a bazillion weeds. And, as, and uh, you, know, you don't want them to get big and shade your plants, but if they're, if they're kind of low growing, like I let a lot of, um, uh, what is it? Um, oh, I know it as good as I know my own name. Plantain. I let a lot of plantain grow, but I don't let it go to seed. But it's low growing and I don't let it take over either. But a plantain plant every six feet in the greenhouse, I allow those. You know, I probably have four or 500 lambs quarters out there right now. But when you look across the greenhouse, you don't see any. But if you walk out there and look straight down, you'll see one every 10 feet throughout the greenhouse. But as soon as they get about two feet tall, they're out of there. I take them out. So I manage weeds different than a lot of people because I don't hate them, because I understand that they have a really important ecological role. So um, I don't know if that answered your question. I hope it did. Did that help, Sharla? Was that what you needed? <laughs> okay. I'm going to go to the next question here. Melanie says, American Meadows sells butterfly and bee seed mixes by the pound if you need. Thank you, Melanie. That's for sure. You can find you can find that stuff all over the internet. Sharla, again, is there a good source for bulk alfalfa? Um, so good question, and I'm going to clarify. Most alfalfa seed is treated with antifungals to so that when you plant them, the bad fungus in the soils that are commonly found in agricultural soils, there's bad fungus that grows there. It'll kill the seed. So a lot of fungus is, or I mean, a lot of, uh, I would say 90% of the alfalfa seed out there in bulk is treated for the antifungal. Now the antifungal that's on there, the, the, it's a fungicide that it's, it's on the, the, the seed. So it, it will kill the bad fungus, true. It also kills your good fungus that you want, that we're trying to get to grow in, the, in our functioning soils. So you don't want to get your um, bulk alfalfa seed from like a, an agricultural supply place. So you want to make sure it's untreated seed that you do get. And yes, True Leaf Market in Salt Lake City can get you, um, you, know, you can buy it by the pound from those guys. If you need like a 50 pound bag, you could probably get untreated alfalfa seed from a place called, um, oh, what are they called? Utah, I think they're called Utah Seed. Um, anyway, if, but yeah, if you just start calling around, you can find places. But if you just need a couple of pounds, because a couple of pounds will plant like half an acre or whatever. So if you're just talking about big patches, in your um, home gardening type situations, uh, just get it from True Leaf Market. It's a good place to get it. So yeah, if you need more information than that, let me know. Uh, Melanie again, can we put the wild carrot roots back in? They were pulled out on Thursday. No, don't, don't go to that much work. You're overthinking this. Once you've pulled it out, you already did the work. Don't do that. Just mix it in your compost. Um, just put them on top of the ground if you want to. If you're not going to make a compost, um, just mix it up with all your dried leaves and your barnyard manure and your grass clippings and whatever else you have, wood chips. Um, don't put them back in the ground. Um, now that everything already came out, just forget putting it in anything in the ground. That will just make it worse. Anytime you go into the ground, it makes the problem worse. You never want to put anything back in the ground. If you're going to add something to the soil, you put it on top of the soil. It just goes on the soil surface. That's the best thing to do. Okay, good, uh, good question there. So Melanie, how do we make biochar? Biochar does not need to be made. You don't need to make biochar. Uh, biochar is a good product. 
there are many people making it. They, if they are making it, they probably have a machine that costs them 10 or $20,000 to create it. But the way it's made is you get wood, you put it in the machine, it burns the wood in such a way that most of the um, carbon stays in the furnace and it doesn't go up the chimney into the atmosphere and what you end up with is uh is like uh it's not ash but it's it's like briquettes that you would cook your hamburgers on in the summertime except it's crushed into a small like a powder so that you it's easy to mix with a potting soil mix but you don't need to make it um, but if you wanted to purchase some and try it from somebody, it's great. It's a good place for microbes to live. Um, but you certainly don't have to make it. Uh, but that's how it's made. And it's, it takes complicated machinery to make it. Uh, but if you know how to make briquettes, homemade briquettes at home for your own barbecue, it would be the same thing. Um, I meant thistle in water makes a tea, which is great fertilizer for plants. Perfect. I've never tried that. Um, if we need a more acidic soil for blueberries, what can we use? Uh, what is the company in Salt Lake City for untreated seed? It's called True Leaf Market. Let me write it in here. Okay, so True Leaf Market, um, um, that's what they're called. And they're online and they have super good service. So True Leaf Market, just look them up like trueleafmarket.com or whatever, and they'll come right up on the internet. So let me go back and finish your question here about blueberries. If we need a more acidic soil for blueberries, what can we use? I wish I had a good answer about blueberries. Uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of a bunch of experiments with blueberries right now. The science that I have been learning in the last five years or so is teaching us that we don't need to worry so much about acidity or pH. And I have a, a project going on in the greenhouse trying to prove this theory right, right now. Um, the only way I know to use, to adjust the pH is using chemicals. So you would go to a uh, Home Depot and you would buy a fertilizer specific for blueberries and that's what you would use. So that would be a man-made type thing to do that, okay? And there are other people who say, oh yeah, you can use, like the home remedy crew, they will say, you can use anything that's acidic like pine needles or pine bark, those are acidic. So you can put those in the soil. The problem with doing that is you're gonna have to go through your own tests to see what works. So if you wanted to plant 20 blueberry plants and you just put a bunch of pine needles out there, it might work and it might not. So to actually have a recipe to tell you whether it works or not is hard. I mean, it's almost impossible. Um, it's much easier to buy a product from a store that has directions on it, but even then you have to do it in conjunction with a soil test that is testing for the acidity of your soil, okay, to get it right. So this is a very hard answer, excuse me, it's a very hard question to answer, um, but, the new science that I am promoting in all of these classes is this. If your soil is functioning, and so that's why we need to do the things we talked about today. We, we put the food in the soil, meaning the detritus sphere in the living root. So that's in there. And then we inoculate with the microbes. So we make sure that the microbes are present because just because the food is there doesn't mean the microbes are. So we put the microbes there, we put their food there, and then we keep them nice and healthy. And that's what we talked about in the beginning of this tonight on how to do that. Once that happens and your soil becomes functioning and that could happen in a week, it could take five years depending on all kinds of 
ecological conditions, okay? But it can happen very fast. Once that happens, the plant, so the blueberry plant would control what is happening in the soil. So it doesn't matter what the pH is, the plant would put out the exudates that would feed the proper microbes so that the microbes would create the pH around the, the uh, root itself. And we understand this is all on a microscopic level. It's happening right there at the root. And then the plant would be able to absorb the nutrients it needs because having the right acid for the blueberry means that it can absorb the nutrients. That's why you have to adjust the pH or the acidity. I mean, those, some people say they're the same. Technically, they're very different, but it's all about um, absorbing nutrients, okay? So I don't have an answer for blueberries yet. I'm sorry. We are still learning and trying to figure that one out. Um, so we have more questions here. Um, thank you, Helena, True Leaf Market, for typing that in. Um, so Helena, I think you may have just sent the true leaf only to me. Oh, I probably did. <laughs> I'm so stupid with computers. I can grow most plants, but I can't do computers. Thank you for saving everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you for thanking me. I appreciate that. You guys are so welcome. Um, you guys are the best. Okay, is there anything else tonight? Here's somebody, Melanie. Yes, so the, the OMRI, O-M-R-I, if, it, if it's OMRI certified, it's like the organic, the, they have the organic certification. Those are the best fertilizers out there as far as being good. They don't meet my standard, but they are the, best standard that you can purchase usually okay so uh so yeah um you can certainly use those if you find an omri listed fertilizer for blueberries go ahead and use it it's it was it's gonna be the best okay that there is most likely okay so yeah use that my newly planted azaleas are not happy and we were warned about the soil here not being able to support azaleas or blueberries. Would mycorrhiza, um, so mycorrhiza meaning the, I can't, I'm struggling to scroll so I can read all this. Your microbes are always gonna help. Um, the Having those um, fungus in there would help. You can even buy fungal spores to get in the soil. You can buy living fungal, um, the myco, what do they call them? It's the, it's the hyphae is what you're buying, but yeah, they call them mycorrhiza. There's different companies out there that are selling those things. So, so yeah, um, they can help. Here's the, here's the big thing though. If you're gonna buy products to put in your soils, You've got to understand that the species that you are getting of these microbes when you purchase them may not live in your area. It's kind of like saying, okay, polar bears are really good for ecology. And then we purchase them and we put them on the Sahara Desert because the Sahara Desert needs to grow plants. Polar bears aren't going to be good for the ecology of the Sahara. I mean, we all know that. That's why I'm using this as an absurd example. And that's the same thing that's happening with a lot of these uh, products that you can buy in Walmart or any garden center. We buy these products and they say, oh, these are going to increase your, your fungal benefits to your soil, or it's going to increase your, um, your like bacteria, it's going to increase nematodes. Like you can buy nematodes, but the species you're purchasing may not do good where you live. So how do you get the ones to grow where you live? You grow them yourself by making compost. 
because when you make the compost, the species that will live in your area are already in your area because they're living on the surfaces of your plants that you use to make the compost. They're already in the wood chips when you put it in the compost. So when you make the compost, they grow to massive numbers. And then when you make your compost extract to put on the ground, you get it out there and it's beautiful and wonderful because those are the species that are gonna grow in your area automatically. Okay, I feel like we're running out of time. That's probably because I'm tired. Um, and I don't see any other, any other questions in this chat. If I missed your question tonight, unmute yourself and ask me. Right now is your chance. And if I didn't miss your question and you wanna ask me another question, unmute yourself and ask me right now. Now's your chance. And if you don't unmute and ask, we're gonna close this down. On the down of 20. Okay. It's Melanie. All right, Melanie, go for it. Uh, John, I can't do it. We have two things going. Okay, just turn it off. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Melanie. Just mute it. That figured out. I'll hear your question. I'm gonna turn mine off. Okay, Melanie was having problems. Anybody okay, else? Okay, I can ask now. John okay, left the room. Okay, go for it, Melanie. And my phone is dying. Um, we have um, uh, an infestation. Are you still there? I'm yeah. here. I can hear you. Okay. We have an infestation of gnats in our compost pile as well as in stuff. Before we took this class, we bought a bunch of stuff from Costco. And I think it's anaerobic, which is why I asked that question. But anyway, um, and we did, we put it out. It's eight inches deep or less and it's gonna dry out. But what do we, I'm finding gnats in my pots that I use that stuff in. And I'm also finding knots in our compost pile. What do we do? Okay, so I'm gonna mute you real quick, but you can unmute in just a second to finish this up. So uh, gnats usually are in there because your soil is a little bit too wet. I mean, your compost is a little bit too wet. So you want, when, when you need to grab a handful of that compost during the process of when you're making it, when you first make it, and during the entire process, and you wanna squeeze it really hard. And if it's producing about one drop of water, when you squeeze it with your fist, when it drops off the bottom of your hand, um, that's about right. If you're squeezing it and you're getting one, two, three, four drops, it's way too wet. And so it can be kind of hard to manage it at that level, but you, you kind of want to do that. You want it at that um, one drop. Um, and that's about the right, um, the right thing. But here's the other thing. Nets are not necessarily a bad thing, okay? So, I mean, they might be annoying. They might be frustrating. If you're bringing some of that compost in the house and you're putting it in a house plant and then you have gnats flying around the house, that's probably annoying. Um, but gnats, them, they don't really hurt your plants. They're not going to be a super bad problem. They are diversity in your ecosystem. So other things like earthworms would be um, eating the, the larvae. Um, there's other microarthropods that they would be a food source for um, before they hatch into the adult stage. So they're not necessarily a bad thing. Um, now, if you absolutely hate them, obviously they're a bad thing because they're bothering you in some way. Um, so I, one more clarifying question, Melanie. Um, you said you think it went anaerobic. So go ahead. I'm going to unmute you and tell me why you think that. Well, I, I don't know if I can unmute you. Unmute yourself and tell me why you think it's anaerobic. I, yeah, I'm unmuted now. Because the bag smelled funny when I had them in the back of my car and I even called Costco. That's where we got it. And it was um, organic. Um, uh, top, it wasn't topsoil. No, it was organic um, mix for square foot gardens, that kind of thing. 
Oh, yeah. And it smelled oh. funny. It smelled funny. And yeah. they said to me, oh, just when you put it out on the ground, it will go away. And the way you described it tonight, I thought, oh, we probably do have anaerobic. And, and so um, that's why I asked the question of what we can do to make it yeah. healthy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I had it in my mind that you were talking about a compost you had made but uh well we have that too oh no oh, okay. not in the compost the compost isn't anaerobic it just has gnats but this stuff we got from costco is i think okay yeah yeah so, so make it healthy yeah i i've never this is a terrible thing it is you know um let me let me just tell you my experience i have never seen a product purchased from a garden center as far as a compost or a, a potting soil or, or a topsoil, any of, none of those bagged soil type things, I've never seen one that was a good quality. And that's, that's, that's sad. I mean, and what that really is, I think as more people learn about these types of things, cause it's not, I'm not just a crazy person talking about all this stuff. There's a lot of people out there discussing these things we've been discussing. Um, and, and as the general public starts to learn this, this is going to open a whole new industry for people who can start producing these good products. So if you have young people in your lives who want to start creating a product for sale, it would be awesome for the Walmarts and the Home Depots and the Costcos and the Lowe's of the world to start getting some really good, high quality uh, products that home gardeners could use that have not been anaerobic, that are not black in color. They have that beautiful dark chocolate brown color. When you smell them, they have absolutely no odor at all because they are absolutely 100% oxygenated, um, you know. Uh, they, they don't have weed seeds. I mean, we've bought stuff before and put it out and there's weird weeds growing. And the only place it could have come from was the potting soil. So weird stuff can happen in this. Uh, anyway, are there any other questions tonight? Go ahead and unmute and just ask me. Can we add something like perlite to break up our soil or how do you feel about that? Okay, so per, yeah. you, you could add some perlite and some vermiculite to your soil. Are, are you talking about a pot, like a container? Um, a pot or a square foot garden, raised bed. Yeah, so when you say a raised bed, are you talk, you're talking about like a container that's like it's up off the ground. Yeah, off the ground, um, 10, 12 inches deep with soil in it. Yeah, yeah so you're, you're, at, you're adding the soil now, right? Yes, uh, this stuff we got in bags from Costco, yep. <laughs> yeah, you, you could add all that stuff in it if you wanted to. That would be fine. Um, that'd be okay. What, what wouldn't be okay, you wouldn't want to go buy a whole bunch of those amendments and then try to till them in an existing soil you would still be going backwards, okay? But yeah, there's nothing wrong with adding some of those products. It would be, it would be a fine thing to do. The main thing you want to do is whatever kind of a soil mix you're putting in these areas, you want to um, do the same thing that we've already been talking about. So once you get the soil made, then you want to start getting a natural detritus sphere on top of a compost you're making from the natural things in your area that you're putting in there. And then as you're growing your garden, try to keep plants growing in it throughout the year, like all 12 months. Even if it's outside, even if it goes dormant in the winter, it's nice to have those living roots in the soil in the winter, even if it doesn't look like it's actively growing. Okay, so, you know, if you had garlic in there, there's a lot of options. All right, any more questions before we wrap up? Okay, thank you for 
thank you for joining us. We will have this recording on my YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And we will be back next Thursday night. Bring your garden questions, bring your friends and your family. And thank you for being here. And you guys are very, very welcome. Meaning you said thank you, so I'm saying you're welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you guys have any requests for a subject that you would like me to talk about, um, you could email that to me or let me know. A lot of you have my phone number. You could text it to me. And if I know something about it, I could prepare a presentation for that. So um, we're going to go ahead and close down this meeting. Thank you for being here. See you next Thursday. Have a good week. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, William, what is your phone number? 435-233-5555. Uh, and okay. you want to text me, not call yes. me, because if you call me, okay. I don't have my phone with me because I break phones. My lifestyle breaks phones. And so I just come in the house and I check, check my texts. So that's how it works. Okay, John will be texting you. Okay, good. Sounds great. All right. Hmm. I wonder how I shut this down. I don't want to record it forever. Oh, it says stop share. End meeting. Good night. End for all. Here we go.